plants. The exocrine and the endocrine. So we have two types of plants. Whenever you hear the word glands, it is as part of the body that produces a hormone. Okay, hormone or substance. We have two types of glands. We have the exocrine and endocrine glands. Exocrine glands are a group of organs that once it produces a hormone, it first goes to a duct. If it's an endocrine gland, once it produces a hormone, it goes directly to the blood. Now, we will now be discussing the exocrine glands. So again, liver, gallbladder, pancreas are exocrine glands. Whenever you hear the word glands, it is a part of the body that produces a substance. There are two types of gland, exocrine and endocrine. If it's an endocrine, it's a gland that once it produces a hormone or substance, it goes directly to the blood. If it's an exocrine, if it produces a substance, it first goes to a duct. Liver and gallbladder, once they produce a substance, it goes to the biliary duct. Pancreas, if it produces a substance, it goes to the pancreatic duct. Liver, gallbladder, and pancreas terminates to the GI system, specifically to the small intestine. Again, liver and gallbladder, once it produces a substance, the substance passes through the biliary duct. That's your biliary tree or biliary duct. Pancreas, if it produces a substance, it's an exocrine gland, it passes through the pancreatic duct. Biliary tract and pancreatic duct terminates or the end connects to the GI system, specifically where small intestine. Exocrine? Yeah. Exocrine system. Yeah, so liver and gallbladder will go to a duct, pancreas will go to a duct, and this duct is connected to the small intestine. So liver and gallbladder, once they produce their substance, it goes to the biliary duct. Pancreas, once it produces substance, it goes to the pancreatic duct. The end of this duct terminates to the small intestine. So that's why exocrine and GI are highly connected with each other. Now let's go first to the liver. For easier understanding of liver, we'll just be discussing liver according to its mnemonic. We will be discussing liver according to its mnemonic. So we will be using the mnemonics LIBER. L-I-B-B-E-R. L stands for liver as the largest internal organ of the body. So if you will be asked, what is the largest organ of the body? Your answer would be? Largest organ of the body. Liver. It's your skin. Yeah? Largest organ of the body? Skin. Largest internal gland of the body? Liver. Largest system of the body? Integumentary system. Largest organ is? Skin. That makes it the largest system of the body. Integumentary. What's the largest internal organ? Internal gland of the body? Liver. So L stands for, so the, for the purpose of liver, let's do the mnemonic. L stands for, it is the largest organ or internal organ or gland of the body. That's your liver. I stands for, it's important in the metabolism of your carbohydrates, protein, and fats. B stands for, liver produces bile. Another B stands for liver is responsible for blood synthesis or blood product production or blood product utilization. What is that, what is that, the, what is that blood product that the uh, liver synthesizes? It's the prothrombin. What's the purpose of your prothrombin? Clotting. Clotting. So again, next is your Liver is responsible for any of the RBC that's early destructing. So early destruction of RBC is being handled by your liver. When does the, the RBC destruction happen? Or when will an RBC hemolyze? Or when will an RBC die? 120 days. 
we will produce RBC or hemoglobin, but the bone marrow produces it good for 120 days. After 120, it has been used up, it will die, it will hemolyze, it will distract. So if it distract, it dies, then the bone marrow is stimulated again to produce new sets of blood. But if your blood starts to have an early destruction, an early destruction is being handled by the liver. So what are, the, what are the things that causes an early destruction of RBC? Hit yourself on the wall. If you, have, if you have a bump in here, what will happen? Blood vessels rupture. Will you develop a dead blood here? Yes, that dead blood will be handled by your liver. Now, R stands for the location of the liver. It's located on the right upper quadrant. It's located on the right upper quadrant. Now, this will be the demonic, and this will be the basis of our discussion. L stand, uh, that stands for it's the largest internal organ of the body. It is, it's self-explanatory. That's the largest one, and it's located in the right upper quadrant. So when will you expect the pain? Right upper quadrant. Now, let's go to the important in the metabolism of carbohydrates, protein, and fats. Let's go to the next part, important in the metabolism of the carbohydrates, protein, and fats. So liver, as its second purpose, is essential in the metabolism of the carbohydrates, protein, and fats. And as we all know, as we all know, once the liver starts, uh, once the body metabolizes carbohydrates, the carbohydrates turns the, the, the body turns carbohydrates into before it becomes glucose, right? So the, the body will first turn in the carbohydrates into a glucose. Now, once it has become a glucose, then what will be the purpose of that? It's the source of energy. So carbohydrate intake will be converted into a glucose, and glucose will be the source of energy. Now in this case, liver sometimes takes part in this production of energy. Why? If this carbohydrate has been converted to glucose, you will use that as a, site, as, as a source of energy. But say, for example, you had a carbohydrate intake, it has been converted to glucose, but you're not planning to perform any activity. So what will happen to the glucose? It would not be used as a source of energy. So it will be staying in your blood, but if it, if it, it, it will not be staying in your blood with the help of your liver. Why? The liver will convert glucose to glycogen. Now, what is a glycogen? Glycogen is a stored form of glucose. So the liver will perform glycogenesis. What is glycogenesis? The liver will generate glycogen out of that glucose. In short, the glucose will be in a stored form. In short, you will be storing the glucose for a while in the liver in a form of glycogen. Liver performs that. In short, liver provides you a source of energy. So in short, if you eat tonight when you go home, and if you study what happens to the bread that you eat, it has been utilized by your brain. If you eat tonight and you decide to sleep, what will happen to the glucose? Glucose goes to the liver, liver and it will be stored as a form of glycogen. What do you call that? Glycogenesis. Liver gives you a source of energy. Now, this glycogenesis, now say, for example, you sleep, and you overslept, you wake up 9 o'clock, the class starts 8.30, what will happen? You have to rush to the school right away or else you'll be late, so you will not be eating. If you're not eating, are you getting additional source of glucose? No. Would you have source of energy? No. But what will help you to perform your activity? This liver will do that. All the things that it has stored before, it will start to convert it again to glucose by performing glycogenolysis. It will lysis the glycogen to put it back into a source of glucose. Therefore, by performing glycogenesis, glycogenolysis, liver gives you a source of 
energy. So that's why they say a person can survive without eating for several days. It's because the liver sometimes stores sufficient amount of glucose that can be utilized even without eating. So that's the liver. That's the purpose of your liver when it comes to carbohydrates. Now, Let's go to your liver as important in the metabolism of your protein. Liver as important in the metabolism of your protein. Now again, there are three byproducts of protein that we keep on discussing. What are the byproducts of your protein? You have your amino acid. What else? Your amino acid, your albumin, and your ammonia. So, your amino acid, albumin, and ammonia. What's the purpose of your amino acids? It's a building, building blocks. Building What's the purpose of your albumin? Um, pressure. Pressure. What's that pressure? Oncotic pressure, osmotic pressure, pooling pressure, right? So that the fluid will stay inside the blood vessels. What's the purpose of your ammonia? No Nothing. Toxic, right? No, so in short, whatever is important, reabsorb. Whatever is not important, have to excrete. So which needs to be reabsorbed? Amino acid and albumin. So liver reabsorbs amino acid and albumin. And liver, what does it do with the ammonia? It will try to excrete. Now, Ammonia cannot be excreted right away. In short, ammonia is not water soluble. So once ammonia goes to the blood, it cannot be filtered out by the kidney because it's not water soluble. It doesn't go with the solutes. So what makes the ammonia to become water soluble? It's with the help of your liver. Why? Liver converts ammonia to a water soluble form by converting ammonia to urea. urea. So the liver will first convert ammonia to urea and once it becomes urea, it becomes water soluble, then it can be excreted by the body. Now look, if I just try to um, plunge in, what happens in a patient with liver problem? Any patient with liver problem, look, if a patient has liver cirrhosis, liver cancer, or hepatitis, what do you think will happen to their muscles? Weak. Muscles. Muscle weakness. Muscle weakness, what else? In relation to this protein? Muscles. Loose. Wasting. Wasting. Would you see them having muscle extremities very thin? Yeah. Yes. Now why? Building blocks are not reabsorbed. Liver is damaged. Amino acid is not being reabsorbed. So in a patient with liver problem, alter all the normal process, that's your liver problem. What else? In a patient with liver cirrhosis, classic sign, a patient with liver cirrhosis, albumin are not well reabsorbed. What will you see in this patient? Ascites. There will be thin extremities, but there will be a generalized edema, centralized edema. You will see their tummy very big. So they will have because of the loss of oncotic pressure. Now look, what else? In a patient with liver cirrhosis, what happens to the ammonia level in the blood? High. 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 So if it's high in the blood, it goes to the? Brain. Brain. That's why they also have encephalopathy. So they will also have an altered level of consciousness because of the ammonia. Kidneys well functioning, but since ammonia cannot be converted to urea, ammonia goes to the brain. So a patient who has liver problem will also have encephalopathy. What is an encephalopathy? An altered level of consciousness due to high levels of ammonia. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's because of liver problem, you call that hepatic encephalopathy. If, you, if, you, if I would just uh, let you recall, have encephalopathy can also be seen in a patient with renal failure, right? Encephalopathy can also be seen in a patient with renal failure, not because of ammonia, but because the kidney fails to excrete. Which waste? Urea. urea. And urea, if it stays in one uh, area for a long time, it converts itself back to ammonia. So two things can be traced from having encephalopathy, liver, or kidney problem. That's your protein. What about your fats? What's the purpose of your liver when it comes to your fats? Liver emulsifies fat. In, a, in a other term, liver escorts fats. Liver eliminates fats. 
fats should never be reabsorbed or fat should never stay on the circulation or else it will cause atherosclerotic problem. Now, in short, the fats will be emulsified and will be escorted out from our, from our blood vessels so that it will not cause atherosclerotic problem. Now, in short, how does the liver do this? It will emulsify, escort fats or eliminate fats from the circulation by keeping it on the liver, storing it in the liver, or expelling it on the feces. Now, both of these can be done by your liver. Now, if it's expelled in the feces, it's because the liver produces bile. So the one that coats the fats, so it will automatically go to the large intestine to the rectum is the bile. So if you eat a high fatty meal, your liver has to produce sufficient amount of bile so that it will go to the it will go to the rectum, it will be eliminated as feces. If excessive amount of fat has been taken by a patient, some of this fat might not be eliminated with the use of bile, but what will happen to these fats? The fats will be stored in the... Uh, it will be stored in the liver it, because it was diverted because of the decreased function of the gallbladder. Now, in short, why? Liver produces bile but the gallbladder stores bile. So in short, you will cause the fat to stay in the liver. It's, it might be because you, have not a, you, you don't have a functioning gallbladder or you are having liver, uh, you are having liver failure or normally you just have an increased fatty intake. So again... The fat will go into the liver for three causes. Normally, it will just go to the liver. It's because the intake is excessively high. It means the, the, the demand is very high when it comes to bile. Next is the fat will go to the liver because the gallbladder is not producing sufficient amount of bile. Why? What stores the bile? Gallbladder. And the third is liver fails to produce bile. But normally, the reason why you would have a fatty liver is because of a fatty intake. The liver cannot supply the demand of bile. So that's your emulsification. Now, with regards to this, the next purpose of your liver is bile production so that you will have a good understanding of the bile production. What's the purple of purpose of bile? This is the one that emulsifies fats. Right? This is the one that escorts the fat, so it will go to the feces. And bile is being produced by the liver. Now, once liver never stops producing bile, so in short, your body always have bile. And this bile doesn't always have to leak into your small intestine because sometimes we don't take fats. If bile keeps on leaking into your small intestine, you will tend to vomit this bile, bile or you tend to excrete this bile. So you would see greenish vomitus from your patient. Now, this bile, once produced, it will be first stored in the gallbladder. So bile will be stored in the gallbladder. So you will first be storing the bile in the gallbladder. Now, this gallbladder will only release this bile upon a signal. And what will be the signal that will cause the bile, gallbladder to release this bile? It's through the signal coming from the fatty intake. So once there is a fatty intake, once there is a fatty intake, this will cause your gallbladder to start to contract. If you still remember, since you are still fresh from your GI system, once you have a fatty intake, you have three layers of the stomach starting to perform an activity, parietal cells, sheep cells, enteroendocrine cells. Mm -hmm. Of these enteroendocrine cells, it produces hormones, the CCK, the gastrin, and the... Secretin, right? Out of the CCK, secretin, and gastrin, one of these three causes the gallbladder to contract, and that is your CCK. So again, your cholecystokinin. in. So again, you eat a fatty food, the fatty food goes to the stomach. Stomach has three layers. The third layer is your enteroendocrine cells, which produces the cholecystokinin. And once the stomach produces the cholecystokinin, it gives the signal to the, to the gallbladder, you have to start 
contracting. If it starts contracting, the bile will start to be released into the small intestine. So that if the fat from the stomach goes to the small intestine, the bile will suddenly will just emulsify it and deliver it out of your circulation by using the bile, emulsifying the fats. That's the purpose of your bile. That's why if you have liver problem, what happens to the fat? It stays longer in the small intestine. It goes to your blood vessels. You will be prone to atherosclerosis. It goes to the liver, causing your patient to have a fatty liver. Liver enlargement, hepatomegaly. Or this can be because of an if be, this can be because of a removal of your um, gallbladder. So once gallbladder is removed, you don't have any more storage for the bile, meaning you might have fat intolerance. So that's your gallbladder problem. So that's the purpose of your liver. It is essential for bile production. Now next, liver, yes. Okay, so, okay, so the liver should be dealing with all this, but people still have, they have fine livers, but they still have cholesterol up. So what's up with, why, does, why is that? Now, they ha it's because of, again, liver just helps in maintaining, keeping the fats away from the circulation. It's just a help, but it is, it, that's not their sole function. They might have a um, healthy liver, but if you have a great intake of fat, the liver cannot always give you the demand. So there is just an increased demand, but lesser supply coming from the liver because the intake is more than the um, production. So production of bile. So that's the reason why liver can sometimes cannot cope up with the need for bile production. So again, the, re the, the greatest way to prevent fat um, formation is, of course, handle the diet. Yes, question. If, some, if somebody... Uh, has been diagnosed with low cholesterol that has to do with liver function? Oh, not liver really. Low cholesterol? No. Low cholesterol. low cholesterol. Because cholesterol is from fat. So if you don't have cholesterol in the blood, then your liver must be working really good. And your intake must be really okay. Right? So that's your blood, uh, that's your bile production. Next will be your blood synthesis. The liver produces some clotting factor and that is your pro- from being. So your liver produces or helps you in producing a clotting factor, which is your prothrombin. Now, when I say prothrombin synthesis, in a more detailed explanation, your liver makes prothrombin an active form so it can per perform its function of clotting. So if you would try to analyze, if liver normally performs synthesis of prothrombin that will help you to clot, if your liver starts to fail, you will have a problem of bleeding. clotting, resulting to symptoms of bleeding. In a patient with liver problems, you will see multiple bruises on their skin. They easily bruise. Try to puncture them just with an acute check. Puncture them. Do not put pressure. They will bleed a lot on that puncture side. Why? Because they don't have sufficient amount of clotting factor, and one of those will be your prothrombin. A patient who has liver problem will have multiple bruises, petechias, and ecchymosis around, surrounding the body. It's because of the lack of prothrombin. It's because of the lack of a clotting factor because of the liver failing to synthesize that clotting factor. So that's your blood synthesis. Now, next will be the early destruction of RBC. Next will be the early destruction of RBC. As I have told you a while ago, RBC, what's its main component? It's hemoglobin. How long does the normal hemoglobin lives? Three months or 120 days. After 120 days, what will happen to the hemoglobin? It will die. In a medical term, it will start to hemolyze. It will perform hemolysis. That's the normal process. If it hemolyzes, it dies, then the bone marrow produces another set of RBC, another set of hemoglobin. Now, if there is an early destruction, early death of this hemoglobin, liver handles that. Now, if the, if the hemoglobin hemolyzes, you will have two byproducts. What are those two byproducts? You have your heme and globin. So synthesis, hemolyze. If the hemoglobin starts to die, it will break down into a simpler form. Heme and globin. Globin is an iron source. Heme becomes bilirubin. And from our previous dis discussion, is bilirubin an essential substance or a non-essential substance? Important, non-important? 
not important or important. Not important. It's a toxic. It's something that you don't need in the body. Now, globin is an iron source. Heme is a, that results to bilirubin. So in short, one needs to be reabsorbed. The other one needs to be excreted. Once what needs to be reabsorbed? Iron. Globin. So globin will be reabsorbed. Heme needs to go out. Now, heme, before it goes out, it will break down into a more simpler form. It will break down to bilirubin. Now, what is bilirubin? Bilirubin is a substance that causes yellowish pigmentation. Bilirubin is a substance that causes yellowish pigmentation. Now, this bilirubin has two forms, a water-soluble and a non-water-soluble. So the bilirubin first is converted to a non-water soluble form. You call this your indirect bilirubin. If I say that it's non-water soluble, what will pop into your mind? It's not your part when digest. It cannot be digested. It cannot be filtered out by the kidney. In short, you cannot get rid of, you cannot get you cannot take it out from your circulation. If a substance is considered non-water soluble, the kidney cannot filter it out. Now, if it's a water soluble, then it can be filtered out. Now, heme is converted to bilirubin. The bilirubin causes yellowish pigmentation. Now, bilirubin is first converted to indirect non-water soluble. Therefore, can you excrete this? No. Can it go to the circulation? Yes. Now, this indirect bilirubin needs to become water-soluble. So, once it becomes water-soluble, that's your direct bilirubin. What causes indirect to become a direct bilirubin? It's the substance that the liver produces. The liver produces, I'll write it here, GLP or your glucorinyl transferase or your GLT. Liver produces a substance that will make a non-soluble bilirubin to become a water-soluble bilirubin. And what is that substance? Glucorineal transferase or GLT. Now, therefore, if the indirect becomes direct, what will happen to the bilirubin? If the indirect becomes direct, then what will happen to the bilirubin? Then you will be able to excrete it, maybe through the sweating, maybe through your saliva, maybe through your feces, through your urine. Now, therefore, if your patient is having liver problem, what do you think? What do you think will happen to your patient? There will be an elevation of bilirubin. Specifically, which type of bilirubin? Indirect bilirubin. If indirect bilirubin elevates, would it go to the blood? Yes. Will it be excreted by the kidney? No, because it's not water-soluble. So if it stays in the blood, then bilirubin as a yellowish pigment will cause yellowish discoloration of the skin. That's why a patient with liver problem has a classic sign of Yellowish discoloration of the skin, which is jaundice. That's the reason behind a rapid and an inability of the liver to synthesize or to hemolyze or to help in the early destruction of the RBC. BNE, blood and synthesis and early destruction of RBC, correlates with each other. Look, liver cannot synthesize prothrombin. Patient continuously bleed. What will happen to this bleeding? It, of course, will try to clot. But if it tries to clot, will this be group of dead cells, mm -hmm. dead red blood cells? Yes, these are early destructed RBC that you need to synthesize. If you need to synthesize this one, what will happen? You will have an elevation of bilirubin. Just to make you to have a good understanding on this, if you bump your arm on a chair, on a table, you will you will burst the blood vessels, right? You would burst the blood vessels there. But of course, you will not die because of this, just because of a bump. Why? You have good clotting factors, right? Your blood vessels bleed, 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 bleed. But as the clotting factor forms, you will clot the blood. Would you have a group of dead bloods here? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, will this be managed by your healthy liver? Yes. Now, how would you know that your liver is start, starting to manage your blood clots here? Yes. You will have bruises and it will start to, to um, have different colors until it becomes 
yellowish. yellowish. If it's yellowish, the liver is starting to convert it from the indirect to direct bilirubin. That's why a person who goes into hazing, you know the fraternities wherein they will start to do hazing, paddle the person, or hit the person. Now, in a patient who have been physically abused, they don't just die because of the injury. They might die because of the liver failure. Why? Because there's too much bilirubin in the circulation that the liver needs to convert or they might die because of the kidney failure because there must, there's too much bilirubin in the blood that the kidney fails to excrete. So those are the reason why your liver is important when it comes to the destruction of RBC. And liver problem complicates each other's function because if liver bleeds, liver bleeds, liver has more bilirubin. If liver causes you to bleed, liver causes a person to have more bilirubin. And if liver bleeds, the blood contains a lot of protein, and protein is a source of? Protein is a source of? Let's do the complication. Patient bleeds because they don't have clotting factor. If patient bleeds, they have dead cells, they have more bilirubin. They will have more bilirubin in the blood. If patient bleeds, blood that they are bleeding contains protein. It's very high in protein. If it's high in protein, then the patient has high amounts of byproducts. And what are the byproducts? Ammonia. Ammonia. And if ammonia is present in a patient with liver problem, this will not be converted to urea. urea. So the more the patient bleeds, the more they have the tendency to develop and set fallopathy or altered level of consciousness. And the last will be the location of your liver, which is located at the right upper quadrant. So when will you palpate enlargement? Right upper quadrant. When will you expect the patient to complain of pain? Right upper quadrant. Will you expect increased abdominal girth? Yes. Now that's why sometimes for patient who has starting liver cirrhosis, liver damage, x-ray, x-ray can actually Long x-ray, chest x-ray can actually confirm that or start the diagnosis. Why? Patient goes to an annual test, patient's lungs are being viewed. If there is an organ that's trying to protrude on the diaphragmatic areas of this patient, that's the liver that is trying to cirrhose already. So that sometimes patients are actually diagnosed because of a chest x-ray because the chest x-ray show an enlarged liver. There's a protrusion of a part of the liver on the upper part of the diaphragm, uh, the right lung, it's because the liver is becoming cirrhotic. So that is your right upper quadrant. So you won't get lost with the purpose of your liver. Just go by the mnemonics liver. And that's what we're going to use once we discuss liver cirrhosis and liver cancer. I'll see you tomorrow for the discussion of pancreas and gallbladder and the rest of the disorders. Also, um, you said you're going to give me that paper, the, the schedule or... You know, because we have to revise it again, because the teacher... No, it's okay. I wanted the old one. I yeah. want to keep it. Can um, I get a copy? Tomorrow, tomorrow. tomorrow. No, I, tomorrow you're going to be busy leaving. No, tomorrow. I'll give it to you tomorrow. Because I'll I have to coincide with the lecture. No, no, not the new one. The yeah, old mm -hmm. one. I can give it to I want to know which one I went through, so I keep it all. You want to say just the syllabus, right? Yes. You don't have any old one? Uh, no, the old one, no. I gave it out already. I usually have to change it every every module, so, so oh, you I don't, don't have, keep oh. I don't know what happened to mine. I just don't know. Um, I can't even get it from this. Yeah. Um, Me too, but I just have to handle no, it I as know. a teacher person. Or oh, oh, you to a teacher. With, um, um, you the, um, so maybe I should come to your office get the paper. Okay. So you um because I lost it. I think I
For the what? Is that we did the re that's what I'm uh, actually asking them if we did the, I think we did the, the remediation for reproductive. I have to check in on my file. Because before I left, I, I thought I gave it already. I actually, I was actually asking people from in the front. He said, he said everything was done. The last one was reproduction, right? Yeah, reproductive system. We're not done it. I'll see, I'll check on it then you will have to determine. Yeah, but not tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, okay, let's go. Oh, this is mine? No. Oh. Who is it? I mean, here. What is mine? I'm confused. I'll be in the Oh, gosh, I'm so dumb. It is mine. Yeah, I always. I think it's mine. I don't know. Anna, he is not. Yeah, it's mine.